I'm um, not, not a, a true blood Canadian. My family's Canadian. I was born in Virginia, but I was educated in Canada, and I'm left-handed, so that, that kind of qualifies me as being <laughs> maybe reasonable that I could be interested in thorium. I actually got interested in thorium because uh, um, I was going to Alaska and, and read a book called Plan B by um, Lester Brown. And I don't know if any of you, any of you read that book, Plan B? Yeah, it, it's a remarkable book. Yeah, all of them, all of them, they're great books. He's a real optimist. He's, he thinks that, that renewable energy is gonna save it. And, but, but what I liked about it, he did talk about Plan A and, and how bad that is and how we need to, to think about Plan B. And he talked about having a wartime psychology. And I think that still applies in many of the remarks I've heard here today. We need to really uh, go beyond the the talking and get into some real action. I'm delighted this time. This is the fourth time I've been to one of these meetings and delighted to see the enthusiasm, the actual um, apparent, we're, we're getting close to, to doing things here and I'm just delighted by these, grad, by these young students here who were telling us about their work earlier this afternoon, very inspiring and many, many inspiring talks. So I'm looking forward to this. Well, I'm supposed to answer, ask three key questions and um, answers in 15 minutes. So. Let's see if we can do it. Um, I spent the last 30 years dealing with questions two and three. Um, and, and I've got a slide for each one of them. You can come press 25 years into each slide. But uh, the first one, I've got several slides because is ionizing radiation always bad for you? It's, it's a real dilemma. Uh, the first time I was acquainted with how much of a dilemma it was, I was seeing this wonderful movie we've been hearing about called Pandora's Promise. It came to Madison. I drove all the way to Chicago to see it the first time. Hardly anybody there. But the attendance, at least in Madison, was really good. It was a good turnout. And uh, uh, Robert Stone, I tell you, he was great. He was on Skype. And there was a panel discussion at the front of the room. And there were various people, graduate students from, and faculty from nuclear engineering at the University of Wisconsin and stuff. And they had this guy who was the director of Physicians for Social Responsibility. Now, I heard a couple of groans and I can understand. I didn't realize this organization was worse than Greenpeace. And, and I was so embarrassed when he got up and said, any radiation, any radiation at all is terribly bad for you, even a dental x-ray. I just about exploded sitting in my seat at the back of the room. Unfortunately, Robert Stone came in and saved me from making a fool of myself, and he just led into this guy. And so uh, I take my hat off to Robert. He, he really did it. Even though he was on Skype, he still came through. So. Is, is ionization always bad for you? Well, in three words, no, not always, and, uh, but sometimes. In embryos, you can have malformations with quite an amount of energy. I think we've all heard about that. You can, it's been proven experimentally. You can change the limb buds of, of embryos and mice and that sort of thing if you irradiate them heavily. And in children in radiation oncology, where I've been working for the past 30 years, um, we, we're very, very careful about irradiating children, particularly anyone actually under 20, we tried to be very, very careful in combining it with chemotherapy and using radiation to very limited fields, particularly that would involve growing ends of bones around the knees, around the shoulders, elbows, those sorts of things, because you could have stunting of limb growth. And even vertebra, if you're gonna radiate a vertebra, you only radiate, you radiate the full vertebra and deal with foreshortening of that vertebra, but never half of it, because there are growth buds on both sides of each vertebral body, and you can have a distortion of the column. So you can get atrophy in children from radiation, in these growing tissues. Now in adults, in adults, cancers naturally arise from a series of successive genetic alterations. That's, that's a heavy statement. Um, we keep talking, we hear on television, when are we gonna find a cure for cancer? Well folks, I hate to tell you, but we're never gonna have, we're never gonna be able to prevent, we can cure more and more cancers once they arise. And we can prevent a lot of cancer by stopping to smoke and various obvious things that cause cancer, but we're never gonna prevent cancer because cancer is basically a genetic alteration. And, and it, it deregulates certain things that keeping the cells in control or sometimes uh, causes a promoter gene to be activated. But other, by other mechanism, they're genetic changes and radiation will simply increase the probability of those generations. And then if you continue to repeatedly add radiation, you can actually damage the cellular DNA. As you know, DNA has got a double strand, and you can break the strand maybe in one place and it might repair itself. We we've evolved with a lot of radiation repair enzymes, so 
uh, we can repair very effectively, but if you have two uh, strand breaks next to one another, you can have a permanent damage. So, so that can lead to cancer developing later. Well, I'm going to show you some data that are kind of interesting to me. I studied this way back in radiobiology years ago, and I dug out my radiobiology book, and I found this interesting graph about, about breast cancer in female patients in Nova Scotia. The story goes back 100 years. This started around 1915. They didn't have streptomycin back then, and when people got tuberculosis, they decided that they would deflate the lungs by inserting a little tube into the space between the pleura and the lung itself. And they'd inflate nitrogen, not air, but nitrogen. They wanted to keep oxygen out so that the lungs would collapse, and in the absence of any oxygen, the tubercle bacilli that were uh, in the, those lungs would starve from oxygen and would die. Also, with compression of the lung, it would also compress some of the lymph nodes at the root of the lung, and there'd be less likelihood of the tubercle bacilli to spread along lymphatic channels. So it was, it was a good idea, and it actually worked. But the problem was they would use fluoroscopy to monitor the collapse of the lung and then the re-expansion of the lung. It'll re-expand by itself spontaneously. For some reason or other, they did this across North America, I'm sure, but Nova Scotia, they, uh, they used bigger fractions. They didn't fractionate or divide it up as much as they did in other provinces. And they ended up giving quite a bit of radiation in the neighborhood of, of uh, 100 to 400 rads. Now, you notice the, the uh, that's a lot of radiation. Uh, this is the number of fluoroscopies. They did not put it into actual number of rads. I don't think they were able to figure that out but uh, in the retrospective analysis. So they just used number of fluoroscopies, and that could be quite vague, but they did see a dose-response relationship to the number of fluoroscopies. So that's kind of a classic curve that you see in radiobiology. Very, very hard to find data like this, because in no other province, in the best of my knowledge, in no other state in this country did they have data like this, because they simply didn't give so much radiation in such big fractions anywhere else during this fluoroscopic analysis. But if you take this curve and extrapolate it back, the logical thing was to assume that it went through zero. But there are two provisos here, actually three. You can come up with three different curves. The first one is, is an exponential curve called a quadratic relationship. And if you look carefully at the destruction of cell capacity for, for, for proliferation after radiation, it's clearly a quadratic relationship. It's not linear. And so if, if it's going to be quadratic for killing cells, it might very well be quadratic for inducing cancer as well. Then some people say, well, there really, there really might be a threshold here. That's a very reasonable, very reasonable hypothesis. If you, um, if you ask people today, um, there's, there's still a divided opinion about whether it's curve B or C. And, and the interesting thing, and I've heard several of you talk about it already today, there is a curve D. And that's a curve that just come, kind of, um, let me see if I can get this thing to, there it'll actually go down a little bit before it goes up. And you saw that some of you may have seen this neat, neat little handout that we had, uh, that the uh, facts on radiation here, and there's a study from recycled steel contaminated with cobalt-60 was used to build apartments in Taiwan, exposed 8,000 people to 400 millisieverts of radiation over 20 years. Now notice 20 years, this is chronic low-dose radiation, not pulses going in which changes the quality of the radiation considerably, but they were, they were expecting a 30% uh, increase in uh, cancer, and instead uh, they found um, it was protective. Um, and so they, um, that's called radiation hormesis. And a number of people uh, adhere to that hypothesis. Um, it uh, uh, stipulates that low doses of radiation within or slightly above natural background levels are beneficial and actually repair mechanisms that protect us against disease. And the reserve repair mechanisms could be effective uh, enough to cancel any negative effects of radiation, particularly in inducing cancer. This counterintuitive idea, I like this last point, this counterintuitive idea is accepted broadly in Japan, of all places, France, and China, but not in the United States. I think we've seen too many sci-fi movies of horrible monsters and things like that. We just we're not willing to accept such good news. Now, this LNT, or linear no-threshold hypothesis, is chosen as the most practical quite a few years ago, not uh, when, when some of these policies were first being laid down by NRC, AEC, et cetera. And it's supported by many who argue that an overestimate of risk would be safe and secure. Well, that's all very well and good back in 19, 
50 maybe or 55, but opponents say that overestimating the risk at low doses really consumes time, money, and resources on reducing risks that are already very small. There's a huge body of evidence was presented at the 212 Symposium by the American Nuclear Society. Anybody was at that meeting? I, I wasn't there, but I, I got the, you can download it, and it's a pretty impressive document. It's about 50 pages long. There's a huge amount of evidence supporting uh, or, or, or negating the uh, LNT hypothesis, and yet our safety standards still rely on this outdated model. Well, I'm going to have a little fun with you and talk about banana equivalent doses. Y'all, many of you nod your heads, you've seen that. It's been criticized because after all, eating a banana is not like getting chronic radiation over 20 or 30 years. But I think it's an interesting thing. It was just said uh, earlier on, all the problem of microsieverts and mini becquerels and all these different units of radiation. I think it's kind of fun to think of, of banana equivalent doses only because it gives us a relative idea of the relative risk of things. If you eat a banana, you get, okay, a tenth of a microsievert, not very much radiation from the potassium-40 that's in the banana. It's also, by the way, in potatoes and lima beans and lots of other um, fruits and vegetables, but it's a, we'll call it a, a BED, or a banana equivalent dose. Now, living near a nuclear plant for a year will give you 90% of that. Nine one-hundredths of a banana equivalent, or of a tenth of a microsievert. If you get a dental x-ray, it's kind of like having 50 bananas. And if you, uh, your average radiation for one day is about 100 bananas. So if you scale down on the graph here, you can see that uh, by the time you get out a year, uh, you can multiply that by 365. It's, it's a lot of bananas. Um, <laughs> but, but it gets you in the league of, of uh, a mammogram, which is 400 bananas. And uh, living in a brick, brick or stone house, is 700 bananas. Just flying across the country is 400 bananas. So all these different things kind of gives you, I think, a very interesting perspective. And of course, you don't want to go for a CT of the chest every day. Um, but uh, of course, in radiation, we do that. Um, when patients come in with a seminoma, this is a cancer of the testicle, very, very radiosensitive. So sensitive that we sometimes give patients a choice after they've had their testicle removed. We say, do you want us to irradiate the mediastinum, which is the area at greatest risk, or do you want us just to follow you with serial CAT scans? And there are people who say, man, I don't think I want the radiation thing, so I'll just get followed with the serial CAT scans. Well, <laughs> they're getting quite a few bananas of CAT scans just being followed by, by those. It might have well, just as well, I think, sometimes had the radiation be done with it, not have so many CAT scans. So, so there, there are different ways of dealing with this. OK, so why should we control this tiny fraction of radiation? 84% of our radiation comes to us from our natural background and about 16 or 15 percent of it from medical and dental procedures. So why do we allow the government to regulate one one hundredth of one percent of our, of our, that might come from a nearby nuclear plant? Our society suffers from nuclear phobia, caused primarily by ignorance, I think, and media hype. Let's look at one other table on life expectancy. I think this is an interesting one. Uh, you can look at the uh, activity or risk here and look down. Not very good to be poor. You can use about 10 years of your life if you're really poor. It's, particularly if you don't have air conditioning, you don't, don't have electricity. Uh, uh, in India, you heard about the temperatures going up into the, what was it, 130 degrees or something like that? It got pretty high in India. And they, they lost about 1,000 people or more in India. Smoking, of course, we all know that's pretty bad. Cardiovascular disease, not too good. Being single, interesting. Being single, you can lose, lose a few years. I suppose it's the spouse taking good care of you, maybe um, providing a little, a little free psychiatric help or something like that, keeping you from feeling suicidal. Uh, uh, this, this is kind of interesting, the last line here. You go down through accidents, that doesn't include car accidents, just household accidents, things. Flu, not too good. Living near a nuclear plant, two minutes, and of course, if you believe in, in radiation hormesis, maybe you gain two minutes, who knows? Uh, so. I thought it was interesting. I don't know, how many of you have heard of Rosalind Yellow? I guess it's good for you, good for you. Yeah, she's a neat lady, comes from New York. Um, she uh, got a Nobel Prize for discovering radioimmunoassays. Neat, neat lady, and uh, no longer with us, but a great, great person. She made these statements, and I just quote them here. No reproducible evidence exists of harmful effects from increases in background radiation, three to 10 times the usual levels. Uh, and I just read you that one about the, about the um, um, cobalt in the steel. There's no increase in leukemia or other cancers among American participants in nuclear testing. 
No increase in leukemia or thyroid cancer among medical patients receiving I-131 for diagnosis or treatment. Now, that one I have to modify a little bit. I would, I would agree with her in general, but there are a few instances where people were given more ID-131 than they should have, and they did come down with thyroid cancer. By the way, thyroid cancer is highly curable, and you treat it, of course, often with I-131. Um, no increase in lung cancer among non-smokers exposed to radon at home, another, another good point. So I think this is the neatest, neatest quote of all. This came out of that American uh, Nuclear Society meeting from 212. Somebody quoted Marie Curie. I've studied at the Curie Institute. I never realized that Marie Curie said this wonderful statement. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. That can apply to this country and a lot of, the, a lot of people in the world. Now, I'm going to have just a little word on grief peace before I shut because uh, uh, Patrick Moore was a former founding member. He opposed nuclear energy in 76, but today he supports it along with renewable energy, so that's cool. Phil Radford, unfortunately, is still opposed to it. He's the new, the current um, guy who uses a tired old story. This slide you've seen twice already in this meeting. It's a slightly different format here. The past speaks for itself. We've got a great energy safety record. Okay, a couple of last slides. How do x-rays cause cancer? Stem cells in an organ, such as the bone marrow, but I use it as an example, are stimulated to proliferate after mild radiation injury. This rapid increase in, in cell division increases the probability of a genetic mutation that could lead to uncontrolled growth, as I mentioned before. Repeated doses of radiation can increase the risk further by causing strand breaks. We talked about that a bit. So understanding radiation effects in vivo was greatly enhanced uh, by Henry Kaplan's research. Anybody know, right here at Stanford, anybody know of Henry Kaplan? He was a great radiation oncologist who, who also studied causation of, of uh, leukemia in mice with radiation. Brilliant man, made some great findings. So how do x-rays cure cancer? Well, most cancer cells divide by, when, when, um, without resting. Cancer cells are kind of like rude teenagers. They never, they never go to sleep. They're just constantly on the buzz. They're not necessarily dividing more rapidly. Some divide more slowly, but they never rest. They just don't go into this resting phase. Cell cycle, it's called the mitotic cell cycle, and only about 20% of them are in cycle at any one time. About 80% are just of normal cells are resting. But the cancer cells, they're, they're just going in cycle all the time. And so if we can uh, focus as much as we can on the cancer cells, give minimal amounts of normal cells in the field, we have this, this advantage, basic cycling advantage, that because cells are most sensitive to radiation when they're in cycle, then even if there are a few normal cells in there, the chances are fairly high that they're out of cycle at that particular time, so they'll be less damaged. Marie Curie, of course, uh, developed a theory of, of radiotherapy, of radioactivity, showed us how to isolate isotopes. She was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize and the only woman to win two of them. Claude Rigaud, I'll skip over him. He was considered the father of, of radiation therapy. He worked at the Curie Institute and used the, um, uh, the had a brilliant idea of using ram testicles as models for cancer. He, his theory was correct that, that uh, spermatogenesis is very radiosensitive, as are many cancers, not all, but many. And so uh, he, he tried to use a dose of radiation that wouldn't damage the scrotum of the ram, and yet would still prevent spermatogenesis or would sterilize the ram. If you did it in one dose, uh-uh, you'd have a big hole in the testicle. But uh, if he divided up into fractions, and the more he did, the more he was able to have normal skin and still do that. And so that concept was applied to cancer, and 100 years ago from now, today, they were applying that at the Curie Institute and then around the world. And so he's often thought of as the, the father of modern radiotherapy. I'm going to get personal for one slide. This, this poster here is in the back of my car. I got it right here, the Thorium Energy Alliance. I said, Thorium will power the world. Ask me all about it or something like that. And uh, this car does get some attention. It's on the back of my car, and I guess it should, because 63% of our energy, we're not as good as Illinois, 63% of our energy comes from burning coal that we haul 24-7 from Wyoming. And my plug-in Prius gets 200 miles to the gallon. I'd rather go all electric and wheel one of these days, but I'm going to be more motivated to when we can clean up the grid. So I'm hoping we can clean up Wisconsin's grid and make it like Illinois. So in summary, did you ever wonder why radiation physicists are not afraid of radiation? Well, they're not because they understand it. Do radiologists have a higher incidence of cancer than other doctors? Not anymore, but they used to way back 100 years ago. Understanding radiation will allow us to control it with confidence, apply it safely, 
and to provide carbon-free energy. Um, so let's help the prejudice to open their minds. Thank you. What is a PET scan exposure? Good, good point. Uh, PET scan Can you is, do it into the mic? Yes. Is uh, going to give you a bit more radiation oftentimes than a CAT scan. It's hard to compare, but in general it would because the radiation. But it's not in a pulse. It's, it's, it can be uh, a little more continuous because you, you're still radioactive. Basically, a PET scan is the injection of a radioactive a form of glucose and it's taken up selectively by cancer cells because they're not only dividing but they're metabolizing. And uh, there's a form of radioactive glucose that is detected but it gra gradually passes through you. So I would say it depends on the volume of tissue being included in the, in the CAT scan. It's a comparable. The MRI, of course, magnetic resonance imaging scan, doesn't give you any radiation because you're looking at the relaxation of atoms that get pulled out of alignment by magnetic fields. So there, if you want to study something in a child or a young adult, an MRI is sometimes chosen as a good alternative. Uh, yeah, uh, doctor. Can lifestyle and diet affect epigenetics to help control when cancer genes are turned on at all? Probably yes. I think we can sometimes overplay that. Um, there are some medical oncologists who, who feel that uh, we're feeding cancers very well if we, if we, and I say medical oncologists because they deal with these questions more often in the dealing with the idea of chemotherapy and, and all kinds of nutritional changes. So I would say if you're undergoing therapy, just eat a normal diet. For those of us who are not undergoing therapy, I'd say eat a normal diet. When, when, we're, when we're 55 or older, we don't absorb vitamins that well, so I think a multivitamin is good. I have a, just a, personally, a, a, a normal diet. I think for our own welfare and for the welfare of the planet, um, it would be better to eat less meat, particularly red meat, but um, that's not anything to do so much with health as it is with the planet. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor.